Hi everyone, this is Kayla. Sorry for the audio quality. I'm in the midst of editing this episode right now. I just want to give a quick content warning before beginning the episode. Imaginary Friend deals with some sensitive subjects, and this includes child abuse, as well as um, child sexual assault and implied rape, as well as domestic abuse and torture. If any of this makes you feel uncomfortable, please feel free to skip. But if, other than that, please continue with the show. Welcome to Dark Blue Lit, where we uncover the true mystery behind the spooky woods and ask, who is the hissing lady? Can the nice man be trusted? What happens if you stay in the imaginary world too long? However, the one thing we know for sure is that you can't trust fucking deer. I'm your host, Kayla King. I'm joined by my other two great co-hosts, Sade. I told you guys from the previous episode, I don't trust deer. I didn't like them. I knew it. I'm just, I don't like deer. And I'm going to get into yep. it. I'm going to yep, get into deer. it. <laughs> I've watched one too many TikToks about the not deer. So you know what? I'm, I'm ready for it. Yes. And my other co-host, David. No, no. Deer are always meant to be trusted. Listen to grandma. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We just read part four of Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chabowski. And... I didn't think one part would have enough to discuss, but it was long enough. I mean, it's as long as the first three parts that we read. Boy, howdy, this goes off the rails in the most beautiful way possible. (laughs) (laughs) I I can't look away. I can't look away. First few parts were so insidious because they really eased us into this clusterfuck. This is the first time in a long time I really feel like the... The book earned the insanity that's go- It's happening right now. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I really feel like if a weaker book, we would have been like, oh, jeez, God. But here, here, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely, I think, uh, with the length of that first few, well, how many parts did we read? One Parts through one through one through three? Yes. Uh, it did give us, like, a taste here and there of just like the level of insanity we get to. And we, at this point don't know how much crazier it could possibly get. Cause we're only halfway through the book, but like those like instances, like where bad cat is talking to uh, Chris, like we thought, Oh, that's pretty crazy. And, but that was just a taste. That was just a taste of the crazy. We ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, so I'll try to provide a summary. Okay. First of all, there's so much that happens. So for the summary, I'm just going to touch upon the more important story beats but we'll definitely talk about like more shit that happens but so forgive me if it's like well what about this what about jenny what about we'll talk about that i promise so last we left our protagonist question mark well yeah he's definitely the protagonist he and his friends just built a tree house and the tree house actually transports him into the imaginary world uh, now, the when we first hear about his journey into the imagining world, he says it in a recollection or basically saying, oh, he remembers his time. And he talks about that the n- nice man guided him and s- warned him, like, only go during the day and only come with me. They can't, the imaginary people can't see you during the day, but at night. All bets you, are off. Yes. Um, however, going into the imaginary world does come at a cost. So when he returns, he starts to know people's secrets um, similar to flashcards. So it'll say, his mom, his mom is worried. And then he also starts to feel feverish as well. But the fever progresses in the most insane way. So this leads to him taking the state exam at his school. And he finishes quickly because now he's super smart, as we remember from the first three parts. And he falls asleep right after taking the exam. And this leads into a Nightmare on Elm Street type dream (laughs) where his teacher, Miss Lasko, is berating him and embarrassing him 
But it turns out that Miss Lasko is actually the hissing lady, and she's trying to get him to tell her who helped him, as she as she did with the uh, bad cat. Uh, he also learns that David Olson is there with her and is basically her little pet demon, basically, along with these other horrifying children. Um, but luckily, the nice man does save him and unfortunately gets caught by the hissing lady as a result. But when Christopher wakes up, this leads to him burning his actual teacher with his feverish hands. And he well, I, he actually wakes up peeing himself, and that's why he goes to the bathroom, which then leads into a fight with Brady and his friends, and then um, Christopher's friends defend him, but Christopher accidentally ends up burning Brady, but then is able to use his uh, burning abilities to basically comfort his friends, but this leads into what everybody gets, they call it the itch, or an itching feeling, and I feel like we'll get more into that in depth, um, but I'll just touch upon it during the summary. So the school, of course, calls the parents because a fight breaks out and you got Brady's mom who's pissed like how dare you you kid hit my son and it's like can clearly see my son is like been beaten by your son and is bleeding and it also is clearly sick but uh Brady's mom being the bitch she is literally um as we figure out later how horrible she is forces Kate to work at Shady Pines that day even though she knows her son is sick because God forbid if her mother isn't taken care of. So as a result, Kate has to buy her a babysitter. So she calls Mary Catherine. Under the not so watchful eye of Mary Catherine, <laughs> Christopher sneaks out to uh, go to the treehouse and rescue the nice man. While there, he finds a Christmas card um, at the treehouse and he realizes it's a clue. And this leads into other clues that eventually leads him to uh, the Shady Pines retirement home where, as you know, Kate, uh, his mom, works. And, and it's there where he learns the hissing lady can manipulate others, the real people, on the in the real world. Uh, and he actually almost gets caught, but Mary Catherine ends up finding him in the treehouse and waking him up. Uh, eventually, these clues do lead in the real world to the library where he finds um, a message from surprisingly, David Olson, in the book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which was uh, David Olson's favorite book of all time. And it is there David Olson admits that he doesn't want to work for the hissing lady. He is trapped. He wants to help him. He uh, tells him that the nice man is trapped in the basement of his old home that he grew up in. And that if there's any way that he can bring David with him to please do. But... David Olson is trying to help Christopher out. Eventually, this leads Christopher to faking well, because he's basically feverish, and uh, it basically says, no, Mom, see, I'm fine. And she's like, okay, I guess your fever broke. I guess you can go to school. Or he basically skips school to go into the treehouse and go uh, save the nice man. And at the exact same time that he's going to David Olson's house, Kate and Ambrose, uh, David's older brother, visit um, David's old home because that was also Ambrose's old home. Uh, there's a couple already living there, but they're kind and they say, oh yeah, come on in. Um, yeah, feel free to look at your old house. Uh, and Ambrose is actually able to find David's diary. And it's later on we discovered through this diary that David is suffering a lot of the same things that Christopher is going through right now. We're almost getting like a cyclical thing at this point. Yes. Uh, Christopher actually does find the nice man and he is chained in the basement been tortured by the hissing lady and he and the nice man barely escape that was kind of harrowing <laughs> um <laughs> christopher returns back into the real world and unfortunately this takes a toll on him because his abilities become more intense which isn't exactly a good thing because now he's hearing everybody's thoughts and learning every knowing everybody's secrets all at once which is a lot for a seven slash eight year old boy to handle and he's becoming even more sick. At 2.17 a.m., and this becomes at a very important time, and I don't know why yet. I think we'll figure it out later on. But at 2.17 a.m., everyone is who has been affected by Christopher is waking up and is starting to feel that itching feeling. And this is going to lead into suddenly everybody catching it and getting a fever. Again, I'll get into it. Now, 
it does show a lot of different people's perspectives, but for now, I'm just going to address one, which is Mary Catherine, whose itching feeling actually leads her to go drive and give her boyfriend a blowjob. <laughs> and this poor Catholic girl filled with Catholic guilt, like, why did I do this? No. And she's driving home and she basically gets chased off by the deer, like a multitude of deer and is forced into the treehouse to hide, where she then falls asleep. Afterwards, we have the Christmas pageant at Shady Pines that leads into another fight among the students. But it's also there where Christopher temporarily cures Mrs. Kaiser, or uh, Brady's grandma, uh, from Alzheimer's uh, during this whole fight confusion. But he gets so sick that he tells his mom, I think I'm dying. So Kate takes him to the hospital. Unfortunately, everyone is feverish, so there's a 10-hour wait at the hospital, which is insanity. Everyone in town has a fever. When Christopher finally goes to see a doctor, the doctor does multiple tests, and he says there's nothing physically wrong with him. And Kate's like, are you serious? Look at him. How is, or why are you, what do you mean he's not, there's nothing physically wrong with him? But Christopher is able to realize that the doctor is being influenced by the hissing lady. The doctor thinks it might be some sort of, um, mental illness or psychosis, so he prescribes Christopher this antipsychotic, which will make him sleep. Again, all under the influence of the hissing lady. Kate takes her son back and is conflicted about giving him the pills or not, but decides, okay, I'll, I'll just do it and be a good mom. Because her son is basically saying, no, the nice man told me that we need to save him. We need to fix this. He's telling her about the hissing later, lady. He's basically telling her the truth. But Kate's hearing voices like, you're a bad mother if you don't give him this anti-psychotic. I find, I, I do find this funny because, and we'll get into it later, that what snaps Kate out of her forcing him to make sure he takes this anti-psychotic is the fact that she's like, wait, I'm not a bad mother, I'm a damn good mother. What is this voice telling me I'm a bad mother? <laughs> and she realizes this isn't my voice. I There's something wrong with this town. We have to leave. And Christopher's like, no, we have to stay. And she's like, no, this town is making you sick. There's something wrong with this town. We have to leave. And Christopher's like, the hissing lady won't let you. And she's like, oh, just try me. And now the reason I bring up Mary Catherine is because later on, we discovered that Mary Catherine uh, misses her period and she's pregnant by a virgin birth. <laughs> In her panic uh, over this, uh, Mary Catherine speeds and swerves trying to avoid a deer and hits the passenger side of Kate's vehicle. And we're left on that cliffhanger. What happens to Christopher? I hope he doesn't die because there's much more to the book left. Man, what a twist would that be? If it like he dies? Jesus. Who knows? We'll see. I doubt it, but damn, what a twist. Yeah. I have a thought. I don't know where it's going to go from here, but considering the next section is called the sleep, my best guess is best case scenario, Christopher's in a coma. I, yeah, that's probably. probably. Best uh -huh. case scenario. Worst case scenario, he's fucking dead. And now his dead, his dead self is stuck in the imaginary side. But if he, oh my gosh, if he's in a coma. Yeah, oh, exactly. Exactly. That's, that's going to, I mean, look at the dream that he has yeah. after the state exam. No, that's what I'm saying. Now there's nothing to stop the hissing lady from tormenting him. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. That's our first prediction. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what do you guys think of the book so far? And what do you think of this part? Uh, one, fuck deers. <laughs> Don't trust them. We'll never trust them. We think we've been well led to understand how you <laughs> feel about deer <laughs> at this point <laughs> so <laughs> uh after that some of it was hit or miss for me the stuff with, I'm, I'm losing interest in mary catherine a lot of the things that are like starting to get a little too religious for me i'm just like mm, okay but like overall i'm still invested in like the kids and mm -hmm. and kate i'm still very curious about this girl with the painted nails we got a little bit of information on that but not a lot mm -hmm. we also learned sheriff's name is bobby bobby i think we we learned that prior but we just like missed it yeah i remember we were debating it last time we couldn't remember yeah i, I try to keep a look for it this time because i was like okay because i keep calling the sheriff the sheriff and it's only this one time that i see bobby so it's like okay he does have a name and I'm not going to lie, when I saw Bobby, my first thought was of the Twin Peaks revival. There's Sheriff Bobby. There's Sheriff Bobby Briggs, that's right. Mm -hmm. or, but, or deputy? He's a deputy. No, I he's think. a deputy. But close enough. Deputy Sheriff Bobby Briggs. Anyway, some of Mary Catherine's part, it, it kind of gets 
repetitive because it's like, oh, I feel bad. Oh, poor Catholic girl. I'm like, yes, I, I know. I'm sorry, poor little Catholic girl. Yeah, Catholicism sucks. And people who get way into it, like to that point where they're basically mentally tormenting Mary Catherine, that sucks too. Just go and say it there as a former Catholic. <laughs> Yeah, same. <laughs> you didn't mention it, but like Miss Henderson stabbing her husband. Oh yeah, I'm always, I'm always down for a good stabbing. So <laughs> that's the most violent thing we've actually seen happen. Yeah, in the real world. Uh huh. It's not too bad because he survived. He probably won't speak ever again. But he, so far, he's he had, wasn't killed. Well, I love the part where the sheriff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where she's like, oh, I'd love to stab him again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's alive? Good. I want to stab him again. Do you guys want to, like, talk about, like, specific parts that we liked or didn't like? Or can I throw a question at you guys? Yeah, so let's... Uh, a question works. I'm... I'm... We're going to be kind of all over the place, and that's fine. Yeah. This part was kind of all over as well. Yeah. Well, okay, I wanted to ask you guys, what do you guys think this itch is? Because everyone has it now and it seems like david's the one who started it but it's clearly affecting people in different ways where for a lot of people this itch is a bad thing and it's making them act impulsive and angry but then for like some of the kids well specifically for chris's friends it like with like matt matt thinks that uh chris healed his eyes now yeah i i feel like we don't know enough about the itch yet because one of my big questions is still, what happened to Christopher in the six days he was gone before he was rescued by the nice man? Mm -hmm. uh, we still don't know what happened during that time. He doesn't know what happened during that time. And that's when he initially kind of got to pick up some of his early powers, like his dyslexia being cured and his intelligence like shooting up. And, uh, you know, that also kind of happened with some of the other kids after they spent time in the woods as well in the treehouse. Mm -hmm. I think what the itch is, is I think this is all kind of a ploy by the hissing lady. I think this is how she's influencing people. Because as we've learned throughout this, the sheriff kind of digs up this information because he sent a bunch of these like tools he found while they were digging up the Mission Street Woods, while the Collins construction was digging up the Mission Street Woods. They found a bunch of artifacts from like the Amish or something. And he sends them off to find out how old they are and then he looks at the town records and finds yeah there's actually been several flu or fever outbreaks because as we've learned like mill grove has had this happen in cycles before not just with david olson which was a summertime thing by the way but in the past it happened to the amish and then something happened closer to the american revolution like this has happened before these outbreaks could and you, could you imagine having a fever during the summer Ooh. oh god well, and this uh, this apparently coincided with uh, David Olson's around with when David Olson disappeared. So I'm led to believe that it's uh, we don't know why the cycle is happening, but the hissing lady is definitely behind it. And my thought is that this is her slowly pushing for a bid to escape or to uh, spread her influence. And it's happened before and she's pushed for it before, but somehow she's either stopped or every time this happens, it makes her a little stronger. I don't know. Um, this is just what I'm hypothesizing here but i think i think because after people start getting the itch they start getting these insidious thoughts in their heads special ed starts hearing you know what he thinks is his grandma telling him what to do uh i can't remember if it was matt, matt or mike but one of them starts talking to thor and thor when he watches the avengers and thor is saying a war is coming you need to be ready and even like the pe other people who got but like mrs henderson only did the thing stabbed her husband after she got the itch i mean brady kind of gets even more forceful about what he's like you know wanting to go after people he doesn't actually but he gets there he's thinking about how he's gonna make those fuckers pay after he gets the itch at 217 although the one thing i this sounds bad you know what no fuck it jenny's itch is leading her to want to basically kill her stepbrother and you know Which what is fuck completely it. justified fuck him completely justified <laughs> No, this this guy is basically a child rapist, and what he's doing to Jenny is horrible. He deserves to die. I'm sorry, I'm a terrible human being. No, you're being. not a terrible human being. Her stepbrother, Scott, is the terrible human being, and yes, he deserves to die. Yeah, I mean, I, th we, I think we all want her to kill her brother, or someone to kill her brother. <laughs> Doesn't have her. to be Jenny. If it is pow all the power to her, I feel terrible for her, but like... That's like the only death that like I really need in this book. Yeah. <laughs> that and all the deer. I mean, I would very much like something bad to happen to uh, Mrs. Collins as well, but that's just me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her too. She she needs her comeuppance as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Putting your kid in a doghouse in a blizzard. Like, fuck. Because 
oh, you're not acting like a human being, therefore you're a dog, so you must sleep in the dog house. What the hell? Wait, yeah, she's she's rapidly also one of the worst people in the book, so. Mm-hmm. We got a glimpse at, like, why she's kind of as awful as she is, because uh, that there's a part where Chris is, is seeing Miss Keezer's, like, memories mm-hmm. and even thinks he is Miss Keezer for a bit. Yeah. And so we kind of, like, through that see that, oh... She had uh, Brady Collins' mother when they were still... No, like, Brady Collins' mother had Brady when she was still very young, and, like, the father wasn't supportive of that. We got, like, a, a, a like glimpses or an, an implication that uh, she didn't mm-hmm. have it so easy. I will say some of my favorite parts in this are the surreal moments, and this book absolutely lends itself to these surreal moments, like Christopher thinking he is Mrs. Keezer or his nightmare of um mrs lasco uh and tra- him trying to escape the, the hissing lady is just it's so beautifully handled and it's just uh I, I i am someone who does enjoy surreal moments so mm-hmm. and this is book is so far chock full it, it's though. really surreal i'm still trying to figure out where the heck we're gonna go from here but all bets are off yeah we can make predictions but it could completely go in the opposite direction though. <laughs> yeah I, yeah we've also we've gained a lot more protagonists as we've gone along i mean technically like we're following you know kate and christopher yeah. but we're also following mary Catherine and the sheriff and mm-hmm. ambrose mm-hmm. and even all the kids to a degree mm-hmm. yeah what i like is how the book really set up the feeling of this town as being like really wholesome and then the further we go we realize just how many skeletons are in this town's closets all throughout the day um because i asked uh our discord hey if you have any questions we're going to be recording tonight this led fang's way to say oh i'm actually reading a book right now and he's <laughs> he's been giving his a uh, shocked reactions throughout it and it's been beautiful <laughs> like one reaction stop praying about deer you've gotten lucky twice leave the damn deer alone no fuck those deer <laughs> How he worded it was, this book is what would happen if Stephen King wrote A Nightmare on Elm Street set in Silent Hill starring John Travolta's character from Phenomenon, only he's like, what, seven or eight years old? (laughs) (laughs) We could have discussed any number of things. Would it maybe be better if we just dive into the questions? Yeah. I I think the questions are going to be a good motivator for this because I think we've said a lot and I, the main thing I wanted to talk about is just I'm really trying to observe the patterns here because that's really important because if this is cyclical then then there is more meaning behind the fact that recurring motifs like besides the deer but like the big eye blue moon uh 2 17 a.m like there's just all these little threads of weird cycles that are coming together I was tempted to put blue moon um at the beginning of this podcast episode but I realized that it would probably lean on the whole copyright issue. What if we do our own cover? Make uh, David uh, play a little bit of it, like, and I'll sing it. <laughs> I could. I'll well, we'll tell you what. If you want, you could just pop this at the beginning. <clears throat> Hang on. Or just leave it where it is. There you go. <laughs> I actually looked it up because I wanted to see how old the song was to see if, if there's any chance of it being in a public domain. Unfortunately, we have to wait another 10 years. Oh, bummer. Yeah, it, it came out in 1936 or 38, something like that. It was written by Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh, really? Yeah. That kind of surprised me. It was like, oh, I'm coolest thing to know. So. Nice. Yeah, no, I, re- I know Sinatra did a famous cover of it. Mm-hmm. But honestly, the one I like quoting is the one that always pops into my head is the Marcel's cover of Blue Moon. I like the Elvis cover. Oh, that's right. There is an Elvis cover. I forgot there was an Elvis cover. There's m- multiple covers, so. It's Blue Moon. Yeah. So, yeah, let's get into our questions. Um, we have, uh, well, we have questions and comments. Um, I'll start with Bringers. Um, Bringer says, thinking back to the beginning, I realized that when Chris went missing and was found, this is all part of the hissing lady's plan. For what reason, I'm unsure. Reading that she controls the deer was a big surprise. Not really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Your mileage may vary. I'm also thinking that since the events that happened when David went missing has me to believe that the hissing lady whispered or helped along other people to kill David. Oh, yeah, that's right. David was found buried alive. So oh. 
It's possible. Yeah, it could easily have been done by other people under the influence of the hissing lady. I mean, I remember that point when he's on the street, but there's that man under the streetlight who like moans and comes at him. Remember? Oh, yeah. The interesting part was I think you actually thought that David may have been the nice man, but that turns out not to be the case. Right. And actually, one thing we should bring up, uh, David had his own name for the nice man. He called him the soldier. That's Mm -hmm. right. And the reason the nice man looks like he does, where he looks like old, but somehow not old, is that he's been, this is not the first time he's been tortured and hurt by the hissing lady. Like his face is literally just scars. That's that's the impression I'm getting from what they're talking about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't, the nice man was already covered in scars when David first met him. It's just something that I made note of because, uh, so we know that uh, Chris made the tree house because the nice man told him to, and that was the portal into the imaginary world but then when ambrose is reading uh david's diary we learn that david had made his own tree house by himself before he'd ever met the nice man or the soldier oh and somehow david found the portal found that his his tree house was a portal to this imaginary world on his own and like was in danger of being caught when the nice man appeared and saved him and he describes him as this like the soldier and he's like covered in scars and so like hmm okay this night so so the nice man was already there full of covered in scars before all this before meeting david if that's the case then maybe the the nice man got the idea of the treehouse from david that's what i was thinking yeah yeah i'm with you and not only that but the the nice man also made a cryptic comment about how David said that the the nice man or the soldier was there to protect people because his father asked him to or something or like that. Or he had like, promised his father to do it. Yeah, the nice man had promised his father. I'm wondering if maybe the nice man was originally from the normal world. Ooh. Mm. Going with some of the religious iconography here, what if the ni- nice man is kind of a weird Christ-like figure? I was going to say, if you say the nice man is Jesus, I'm going to f- <laughs> freaking hate I would, you. I said Christ-like. Not <laughs> his father asked him to come here to protect him. Oh, no. Look at all the ravaging no. details. Oh, man. If this book takes that turn, I'm just... Throw it against the wall. How I, dare I'm not going to buy a copy like I thought I was, so that's for sure. Um... <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Who knows? Maybe that's the speculation. That that's I, again, all bets are off because I keep thinking about just the only per. I mean, they're leaning on it a little bit, but mostly with Mary Catherine. But that's because mm-hmm. that's all Mary Catherine knows is the fucking Catholic view of the world. And then we do have like a contrasting view through the sheriff, through Bobby, because like he the little the I, I don't know if he's like just seeing things okay I, oh, that's also something else that i wanted to point out oh, yeah but she's yeah. like the girl with the painted nails that he keeps seeing now is like god is a murderer oh yeah so that's interesting remember how he's like right on the cusp of figuring something out when he gets kind of lured into the treehouse by what he thinks is the girl with the painted nails and that's the last time we see him no he comes he comes out from that Oh no, you're right. He did, and he that's he takes the tools to his friend. Uh, he falls asleep because he's sick, and he's trying to remember David Olson's name, but he keeps forgetting it. Yeah. Okay, I got I got mixed up on that part. There was a connection though that he made though, right? Wasn't it the the flu thing? Uh, probably oh, yeah, was that. Cause... Yeah, that he like that the, the flu had happened around the time of his disappearance. I think that was it. Yeah. That was the last time we saw the sheriff, was he yes. made that connection. All right, well, one thing that I wanted to point out was, like, a lot of the people who have this itch and are now, like, hearing a voice, well, like, I think the only exception would be, who was it, Mike, who's talking to Thor? Mike or Mike or Matt that's talking to Thor. But everyone else, it's, like, for special ed, it's his grandmother. For Mary Catherine, it was literally the Virgin Mary. For the sheriff, it's the girl with little painted nails. And, like, I don't know, I was just, like, noting, noticing that it's, like, like these feminine figures. So it's either, like, the hissing lady. Obviously, she's taking f- different forms. And even, in Kate's case, the actual voice of the person to, like, manipulate them. Yeah. Oh, man. So, like, I'm worried, especially for, like, Ed, because he's been talking to his grandma, his dead grandma. And he has the gun underneath his pillow. Like, mm. Like, you, like, okay, that scene where they're, like, being Chris's little bodyguards, I had that same reaction of Kate. It was like, oh, this is cute, but also kind of unnerving. But for me, it's like, Ed's really got the gun in his backpack, and I really don't want him to, like, shoot anyone. 
Unless it's Jenny's uh, big brother. I hope this is all a conspiracy that at the end, all this horrible stuff is like the hissing lady reaches full of Zenith and like, I literally did all of this to kill Scott. And then the entire <laughs> town tortures and kills Scott. Oh, also, Jerry's looking for them now. That's right. That's right. You, and you called that. Told you. <laughs> That's got to be something on the coming up soon is Jerry showing up at some point. That's... Yeah, Jerry's going to show up. Jerry's going to show up and Kate's not going to be able to get away because Chris is in a coma at the hospital, so she can't leave. Oh. If we're putting our other predictions together. This isn't a bad prediction, though. Oh, uh, anyway, Bringer's question, uh, he says, if the hissing lady won the first time, what did she win? I think the first time she got the key, maybe. Oh, the key around her neck. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know what that key goes to? Did I miss this? No, we don't know anything about the key yet. It was just mentioned she's got a key. She's got a key. Again, there's a lot of threads we don't know about yet. A few have been answered, but there's still a lot. The key around her neck. We don't know why she can't go on the street. We know it burns her feet, but we still don't know why. We don't know why the cycles keep happening. We don't know what still what happened to Christopher during those six days. Or what if the connection to the, if any, to the coal mine is? That coal mine that's right by the... Oh, uh, that's right. That didn't get brought up again. Or yeah. that, that hasn't been brought up again. Yeah, yet. but there is that coal mine that's right there. Another question that Bringer has is, what do you guys think of the power that causes the rashes? I at first thought it was the nice man's power as a cure-all, but I'm starting to think the power is a conduit for any bean, both good or bad, from the imaginary side to get into the head of said person. Yeah, I think ultimately it's the, the hissing lady manipulating the situation because he's inadvertently giving people a, a link to the imaginary side that hissing lady is either exploiting that or was planning it all along as we've as we established in that last chapter in particular she's playing a long game yes. the hissing lady and i mean she set up everything just so uh christopher and kate would be in the path of mary Catherine's car and then he asked, could the reason Christmas Day is the end all be all because the power of imagination or belief is strongest on that day? I had actually thought at first that possibly Mary Catherine would bring the hissing lady into the real world on Christmas Day as a Jesus reference. Oh, yeah. So we get a lot of questions about Mary Catherine's pregnancy. Should I start? I mean, it's probably the most like, what the fuck? Yeah. Of all the stuff that's happened. So because uh, Dan actually asked, is Mary Catherine actually going to birth something? The Immaculate Conception theme along with the Christmas timelines makes me think she is. I really hope she's get some metaphorical birth instead of something physical. Poor cow. And then he also asks, will Mary Catherine get her sweater dry cleaned? <laughs> And then uh, username actually asked, do you think Mary Catherine is actually pregnant or delusional? Either because of the hissing lady, a stress-induced psychotic break, or some combination of the two. You want to know what I think? You want the lowest common denominator is? It's the Antichrist. <laughs> the hissing oh lady is the God. Antichrist. No, yeah, no, or, she, or the hissing lady is the mother of the Antichrist. Holy crap. Yeah, the whole Immaculate Conception thing is really throwing me because it does seem like she actually is pregnant, which is nuts. But we we, we know that she slept in the treehouse and something was spooning her in there. <laughs> what a weird way to... She thought it was the... She said, she said she thought she heard the voice of Jesus and that she thought it was Jesus comforting her. But she said at the end, it's like Jesus sounded feminine or female. Mm -hmm. The voice sounded female. It was the hissing lady. She, the hissing lady made her pregnant. It is kind of the most bumfuck wild thing because as soon as she's like, oh, I think I might be pregnant. I'm like crazy Catholic girl thinking she can do that blow drops can get her pregnant, weirdo. But, and she, then, but then we know she's smarter than that. Cause she's like, no, that doesn't make any sense because like you took health classes. You know that this is not possible, right? But she is so, so afraid of, of just fucking up, of like shaming her parents that like if she's giving any inclination of like, oh no, maybe I am pregnant, then like it, it's not that far of a stretch for her to make that leap. Like, True. Yeah. I think for like, like if Mary Catholic, Cath I almost said Mary Catholic. Mary Catholic. <laughs> Mary Catherine <laughs> can believe that God will make her hit a deer if she's going to hell, then it's, it's really not that crazy that she would think, oh no, I am pregnant because I... I thought about it because I thought about sex and that made it so. That's true. She is pretty much just been fed the whole do Catholic dogma to the extreme. Mm -hmm. I think she's delusional. I, I don't think she's she's actually pregnant. I think it was just whispered into her head so that she panics and, you know, ends up in this accident. 
if she does end up pregnant, I don't I don't know if she's actually going to physically birth a thing or if like a portal's going to rip open in her womb and the hissing lady's going to crawl out of it. I don't know. It's this thing anything could freaking happen. After this, after reading this part, I you know what? It's true. She might birth a fucking deer, who knows. <laughs> It's going to be like the movie Lamb, but with deers. Stephen Graham Jones has going to have something to say about that. <laughs> so username actually does ask, which one of the revealed secret lives of the characters made you go, oh shit, the most? Jenny. Jenny. Yeah. At what point does she like mention not liking her stepbrother? Because at that point it was like, oh shit, I'm sorry, kid. I don't know. I my mind immediately picks up on like the really darkest shit, so that didn't su- it didn't surprise me, but it was very like, oh fuck, that sucks moment. For it me. was I think the moment you're thinking of is right when Christopher just did the flashcard thing with her and said like she she wants to avoid her stepbrother's room or something like Probably, that. Probably. Yeah. The moment that came up, I'm like, oh no. Mm-hmm. I'm with you there. It was more just reading that part. Like it told me everything I needed to yeah. know. Yeah. It just got more horrifying when it actually went into a little more detail. I'm like, oh, it just made me hate this person even more. And the sad part, isn't Scott a teenager too? Yeah. Like, or uh, like 17, 18, uh, 16. He has a car. I think he's supposed to be like somewhere between 16 to 18. I don't think he's, I want to say he's 18, but I don't think so. I mean, it excuses nothing, but even so, it's even worse. Old enough, old enough that he knows he's doing wrong. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And like the things that that Jenny mentions in passing that she knows about him is is awful. And then the fact that she says floods and he addresses that to her about um, her pajama bottoms or something. uh, And uh, like just the parts of him like talking about, oh, that's too big for you. Or just like, it's so gross. It's very gross. I did like uh, in terms of for like Brady, that surprised me a little more. Like it was obvious. We had hints of it earlier that his mom was abusive when I think the sheriff was mentioning like how he spilled, Brady spilled something when he was invited to dinner. And he just knew that as soon as he left, that kid was going to like get an earful. And like, Mm -hmm. you think, oh, okay, well, maybe they hit him or like, I didn't expect it to be like, yeah, you're going to go fucking sleep in the doghouse in like freezing weather. Like, damn. I don't know if you guys have seen Erased, but it made me think of Erased. I have not seen Erased. Mm -hmm. It's an anime and it, it... does delve into child abuse and there's this one girl who dies because her mother uh she like lets her she like pretty much throws her into the shed outside and she like freezes to death out there jesus christ so uh, what a lovely chapter set of chapters What what a lovely arc we're going through right now obviously this itch whatever the intention of this itch is part of it is it's bringing out the worst in people yes and i feel like what a lot of this these this part because it was just one part we read was to put on display like how awful people can be Mm -hmm. i think it was like because we have like a lot of crazy stuff (laughs) like a virgin a virgin married teenager and we have kids talking to fictional characters i think some people in reality think they can talk to fictional characters but we're not gonna get into that um I mean, wasn't there a whole point in there that they said nobody's at, I can't remember where it was quoted exactly. It was like, it was like, no one's really crazy or something along those lines. Like it was, there's no such thing as insanity. It's all. It's all from someone whispering in your ear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it was something along those lines. There's a couple more that I want to get from our uh, listeners, but this was my question. What do you guys think the imaginary world is? What is its purpose? And what does that make the hissing lady and the nice man? Are they from the real world? Did, were they born in the imaginary world? I don't know if we know enough to answer that question yet. Mm-hmm. I It seems like it's just like a parallel world to ours, mm-hmm. whatever it is. I thought initially that maybe the nice man was David Olsen. Yeah, we all, I think we all did. So I thought maybe like this was kind of like some kind of, uh, like some kind of limbo, like universe before, like I don't know, spirits are trapped. I thought initially it might be something like that, but I don't think that anymore. It de- it feels like it's its own parallel universe. Yeah, that's the confusing part to me because I'm trying to figure out what is this imaginary world's purpose? Why is it here? Yeah, is this something created by the hissing lady or? Because we've been told that the hissing lady controls this world, right? Or is in charge or? Yes. So why? Why her? Here's actually a comment and a question from Dan. And I think this is the last of them. Dan says, 
Okay, so thoughts on this section. The book did a good job of hooking me, and I appreciate that because the next part is wild. The action and harder horror parts aren't hitting for me like the subtle stuff in the first few sections, but I am along for the ride by now, and I'm reserving judgment based because I trust the author to give a payoff based on the first part. So his question is, what arc do you enjoy the most? Between the Chris slash kids, Mary Catherine and Ambrose, I guess, I started out really into the kids, but now I feel like their stories are a little grand and silly. I'm liking the smaller scale of what's going on with Mary Catherine, whose arc felt a little flat to me initially. Mm -hmm. I'm still on the same page, but I think, yeah, I think Mary Catherine uh, grew on me a little bit. I mean, I mean, I know we might be disagree on that saying, but like, I think what she's going through is, is pretty horrific and pretty almost like it's uh, more than anyone else, like self loathing driven mm -hmm. just because of everything she's been taught. I think, it makes for effective horror as part of the whole thing because the horror of like everything that you're taught in this like really constricting religion like the fact i i hate I, it breaks my heart when she's ranting about everything with herself it's like why do women always have to be so dirty and unclean in general she wishes she could just be pure again but it just breaks my heart because that's like you know it, the only reason that exists is that idea exists is because of the dogma mm -hmm. i don't hate the stuff with mary catherine it is a level, it's 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 a different kind of horror because this is very much based in reality. There are people who have gone through this experience where they've been raised a certain way, led to believe a certain way, and when they are confronted like with real re like realities of, of what actual life is, they're like, oh no. Like the whole, like, oh, why are women so gross and dirty? She thinks that because that's what she was taught. And I was like, no. Exactly. Like... like girl you want if you enjoy sucking dick then get out there and suck some <laughs> dick like i feel so bad for her and maybe that's kind of like why i'm not enjoying it as much because it's just like maybe too real and i feel bad mm. for people who yeah. have experienced this or are experiencing this it does make for effective horror though yeah right? yeah it's it's yeah. it's effective because it's it hits it's real it's the real yeah. type of horror um, and that, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Like, there's a lot of crazy shit that happened in this part, but like all like the really horrific parts that stuck with you are like the shit where like, well, this this here could happen to someone. Someone could mm -hmm. be abused by their mother or their stepbrother, or could be led to you know think they're going to hell, or be you know lo sought after by their abusive ex. You know that shit. That's the real horror. Mm -hmm. Overall, I don't know. I think I kind of enjoyed parts one through three a little bit more um uh, i think this got a little too crazy i like surreal but i also it's hard for me i have to be in the right mood for when things get really surreal um uh, but i'm i'm in i'm like i gotta know what happens so and i think we already decided we're just gonna finish the book from here i think uh i agree i think i enjoy parts one through three more because it is more subtle I think the surreal parts are good because they do, they're justified and we are led into them very well. Like it, it is built up very nicely. If this just happened, if ever, the whole book was just chap, basically like part four, I'd be like, I, okay, I'm done. Yeah. But because it is built up so nicely, I did enjoy part four, but I do kind of miss the subtleties of part one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. the the author's got to stick the landing that's the important part. yeah yes. yeah i think so i'm curious to see what happens from here on out so i want to if we don't have any more questions what i want to ask you guys is like what like story like what arcs that we have here like everything with mary Catherine or things with ambrose or like with jenny and brady or just the kids like what do you want to see happen like i want to see mary Catherine be like fuck you mom and dad i'm gonna go and be like the nastiest bitch that i want to be <laughs> maybe not like that exactly but just like i want her to see her liberated like i think that and like a couple other things are like how i need in the right. end of this book i i want more people to have a kate reese moment Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where they're able to deny the voice in their head. That's why Kate, that's why that moment is so awesome. Kate's a really great character. Yeah, let's give some pre We haven't really talked Kate. about, yeah, Kate, Kate is awesome. Kate is best mom. Because she's very smart. The pushback against Chris is basically her motherly instincts kicking in. She has no problem saying, what the fuck is wrong with you? She, like, with, a, like, even with the doctor there, he's like, oh, there's nothing physically wrong with him. Are you fucking- He has a fever. He's burning. He looks like a ghost. Are you fucking kidding me with this shit? 
yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm with her. Why is this doctor? Yeah. And I'm glad she picks up on that instead of it's like, oh, okay. But, like, she's she knows that other people are in the wrong, but she, she knows that, like, she can't fully bend the rules because she's still the low man on the totem pole. That's true. I really like the moment, though, the way that Christopher is able to convince her is that he, he just said, the nice man just tells him to tell her about all this stuff he wouldn't know. That's very personal in her past. But I love the fact- We learn a lot about Kate in that moment. But I love the fact it's not what Chris has told him, because even the hissing lady is like, oh, his father told him that. His father told him that. It's her realizing, wait a second, no, this isn't my inner voice. Yeah. It's like a reasonable impression of it, but there's something wrong with it because- like, she figures it out on her own. And I love that. That was a crowning moment of awesome for, for Kate. And I hope she gets more of that because you, I, I pity anyone who gets between her and Christopher. Mm -hmm. I would like to see her beat the shit out of fucking Jerry. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry, yeah that, Jerry would, that would be great. What I would love to see is, like, if Jerry shows up and it's not like, oh, oh, no, Sheriff, save me. But, like, she saves herself and the Sheriff from Jerry. Yes. Yeah. That would be fucking badass. Um, <laughs> I, I do want her to have a happy ending with yes. the Sheriff. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. But the, sh the Sheriff is a genuinely, like, good guy. And I want things to go well for him, too. So. Yeah. I want Ambrose to see justice done. Yeah. To know the truth about what happened. That's what I would. This is what I want. I don't know if it'll actually happen. This is a horror book, but. I want that for Ambrose, too. Honestly, I don't know why, but Ambrose is... I feel so sympathetic to Ambrose when I read his parts. Mm -hmm. Because he's he's an old man, and I, I've heard this from um, people who are like much older, like in late 80s or 90s, and they have said, like, well, all my friends have passed away, all these people have passed away. I, I'm just trying to live the best life I can, but there's no, oh, you gotta move on whatever happens happens and he and him saying with his wife is like why do i have to move on i miss her <laughs> and uh also the fact that he is taking this time to resolve issues with the loss of his brother that he does feel this guilt that even years later that it is his fault about his brother and i'm like mm. oh ambrose it's not your fault honey yeah I feel a lot for ambrose's character i really hope that like chris heals his eyes at some point. Oh. Oh, his cataracts, yeah. yeah. That would be nice. That would be, you know, before the end. Things that I, like, want to see before the end, like, uh, going back to Kate, uh, if if Chris does end up in a coma, I want to see Kate kicking some ass, some <laughs> some uh, hissing lady ass. This, this is just, like, gut feeling. Like, I have no real, like, reason to, like, suspect this or think this. It's just kind of a gut feeling. But I think miss collins is like somehow connected to the hissing lady oh. i don't know if like the the like miss keezer the state that she was in before uh chris kind of like brought her back to her senses i think that was caused by the hissing lady yeah something about the hissing lady is now in miss collins like she's unknown unknowingly connected to the hissing lady is is just a gut feeling that i have i have no basis for it it's just like hmm Hmm, looking at you kind of thing. Do you think, um, I mean, on the Collins connection, I have a feeling that the fact that the woods are being torn up might have something to do with it, the, the reason this is happening now. Because mm -hmm. I, I had a question earlier, uh, but we moved on in the conversation. We know that David built a, a treehouse. What happened to his treehouse? Did that get torn down? Oh. Why didn't yeah. the nice man be like, hey, go check out this treehouse because it already conveniently has a portal. They had to build a new one. Like, why? Where is David? Yeah, what happened to it? I'm wondering if... The, and was that, it the same tree? Was it a different tree? Because this clearing seems really important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, like, those tools, maybe those were the tools that David used, except it kind of implied that they were much older, but maybe David found mm -hmm. those tools. I mean, what if there's just been a six subsequent series of tree houses? Maybe there was a tree house that was built back when, when the Amish were in the area, you know? Like, you gotta wonder. And then also, how is the, the mining area related as well yeah that's true there's the coal mine right there also one i guess one other thing that i want to happen is i want to see kate reese run over some deer <laughs> oh my or God. mary catherine run over some deer actually yeah you know what i want to see mary catherine run over, finally run over a deer <laughs> and say fuck you god <laughs> god is a murderer 
<laughs> oh man. I'm like looking through my notes trying to be like, okay, hey, what else? What else? Because there's so much. I mean, like, we didn't talk, we kind of touched on Miss Henderson stabbing her gut, her husband. I'm listening to the audiobook. I'm usually doing it, I'm usually listening while I'm cooking or, or working on something. And I think I was like specifically cleaning in the kitchen. Did, did, was there a line saying that her husband was sleeping with other men? Did I imagine that or was that there? I, I picked up on that too, but I wasn't sure. Like, the sense about the men he ran around with. Yeah, okay, that's so, okay, I wanted to confirm that, because I, it was, it was so brief, and I was like, I think I was washing dishes, and I was like, wait, wait, what? What? I, and my hands are wet, I can't hit the back button. And then, okay, Miss Lasco, the teacher, they didn't say, okay, we find out she's an alcoholic, and now she can't get drunk, and she's like, she's like, going through withdrawal. But, like, I think the sheriff, it was when we were from the sheriff's point of view, was talking about how, like, he had to deal with, like, two guys that, like, started a bar fight against each other because this woman who like out drank them said that they should fight to the death to, for the right to sleep with her. I was like, Miss Lasco. Oh my God. It pro- Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's all crazy. I, t- I found it. Didn't he remember that she had to ask his mother how to cook that meal? Didn't he remember that a beautiful young woman with gorgeous red hair working like a goddamn slave to prefer- perfect that meal he keeps chewing and chewing like a goddamn dog? Do you think that the man, the men he ran around with we're going to learn to cook him that meal. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, that does imply to me that he's, maybe he was closeted for a while and now is doing this. I think he still is closeted. Well, yeah, he. I think he still is and he doesn't realize that she knows. Oh. And like he, he probably resents the fact that he couldn't, he couldn't live the life that he wanted to live and, you know, sees her as part of the issue. Mm-hmm. That sucks. It sucks for both of them. Yeah, it does. Don't closet your kids, people. If your kid comes out, make them feel comfortable about coming out. Yes. Don't don't let um, old women stab their husbands. Or <laughs> don't make realize. old women stab their their gay husbands because they're gay. <laughs> let your kids be themselves. God damn it. Yeah. I mean, okay. I don't think I have anything else that I need to like touch on. Yeah, I think I'm good too. I was gonna say like. I, th- I was going to ask, do you think this is effective horror? And I'd say, I think we all agree this is effective horror. Might not be my cup of tea horror, but I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this. It's insanity. It's like absolute <laughs> chaos. And that's kind of compelling to me right now. Uh, we spoke before this and I asked some of our listeners in our Discord server, would they be interested in continuing reading this for next month? And I think we all agreed, like, we're already along for this roller coaster ride. Let's see it all the way through. So, and I, I did the calculations. It's about like 320 pages left, I want to say. We can do that. Which, that's the size of a normal novel. I think it would be just best to finish it instead of just taking a break. Because otherwise, I there's so much that happened and I don't want to forget it all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for next month, uh, for March, we're going to finish Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chabowski. Oh boy. Buckle up, kids. Uh, The cool part, though, in our novel, too, there is actually uh, reading questions, like book club questions at the end. Ooh, that's going to be fun. So I might look through those and use those to have us lead in discussion. Yeah, what if if we gave those prompts to our our listeners, too? Like, Oh, that would be great, too, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could absolutely put that in our Discord server, uh, actually, if any of you are interested in um, being in our Discord server and want to talk about this, uh, get more in depth and actually have conversations with us about the books we read, join our Patreon. Um, you can join by going to the Midnight Marinara Patreon. Or the Creative Horror Patreon. Or Creative Horror. Do we have a Creative Horror Patreon? Uh, creative Horror does not have a Patreon page, but we do have a, a coffee page. And I can set it up that if you subscribe to donating there for like a minimum a dollar, then we, that will give you access to the Discord as well. Sweet. So for only a dollar a month, you can access our Discord server and join us in the conversations about the books we read for Darkly Lit. There's this and many other perks to going there, including uh, you know conversations about the other podcasts on the Creative Horror Network, which I'm also excited to mention. Uh, we are getting a new podcast on Valentine's Day, day after the day after this episode releases. Uh, the Jameson Tapes. Which uh, will be hosted by um, our good friends Alan and Abysme as they discuss 
some strange horror movies and drink their way through. <laughs> I am looking forward to this. Me too. I cannot wait to listen it to this. It is, uh, so I get the honor of being editor yes. for that podcast, so I, I've already... I, I've, we've done th- we've recorded three episodes that I've been able to sit in on and, and listen, and then the discussion after, and we have the first episode ready to go. Uh, there is a trailer already on creativehorror.com if you want to go look at that before, if you can't wait till tomorrow. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the first episode was definitely a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to hear Alan and Abysme completely lose it, uh, <laughs> definitely check out the first episode. <laughs> Uh, again, if you like what you hear, check out our, the other podcasts at creativehorror.com. And also check out our YouTube page and search Creative Horror. Uh, feel free to subscribe um, and also uh, leave a comment. And smash that like button, <laughs> says Bad Cat. Oh my god. I can't help but picture him like Heathcliff, you know, like specifically Heathcliff. Anyway. I picture him as this like knockoff Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh my god. Do you think we'll see more Bad Cat? I I absolutely think we're going to see more Bad Cat. Because we're going to get Bad Cat 3D 2! Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinara, and this podcast is part of creativehorror.com a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. <laughs>